Hello, good morning. Uh, welcome to the National Landcare Conference 2021, the virtual conference. And today is our second day of the conference. And I would like to encourage all participants to please submit your questions to the question box that you see on the screen. And our first speaker for today is Elise Harold Woods, who is the acting chief biosecurity officer at the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. So over to you, Elise, please start your session. Thank you very much. Uh, so good morning. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional custodians of the land I come to you from today, as well as the traditional owners of the various lands on which we all come together to meet for this occasion. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Why and how does biosecurity matter to land care? Biosecurity might not be a word that you hear very often in the work that you do. However, for land managers, it is absolutely integral. Australia's natural environment is at the heart of who we are as Australians. Our unique flora and fauna, productive agricultural land and spectacular deserts, rivers, coasts and reefs are part of what makes Australia a truly special place for us to live, work and play. So just quickly to set the scene, what is biosecurity? Essentially, it's about keeping out and managing the things that aren't welcome while facilitating the movement of people, goods and vessels in, out and around our country. As you can see from this slide, biosecurity is perhaps best characterised as both a science and an art. Science underpins almost everything we do and the decisions we make. The art comes in because things are always changing and we have to work with a huge range of stakeholders, both directly and indirectly, to get the best outcomes. The Australian government's work is focused on preventing unwanted pests, weeds and diseases from arriving at our border. We work with a wide range of partners overseas, including governments, export industries, port authorities, shipping companies, production and manufacturing companies and the research sector to identify, respond to and prevent new and known biosecurity risks. For example, the risks with brown marmorated stink bug or BMSB, which is up on the screen here, uh, it's a social and horticulture pest, and the risks associated with this pest have changed in the last few years, as this species has invaded more countries that we trade with, including the UK, Chile, Poland and Sweden. So as a result, we've introduced seasonal measures that apply to targeted goods manufactured and shipped from target risk countries, as well as vessels that berth, load or transship through those countries during the months when BMSB is of greatest risk of contaminating goods or vessels and surviving the journey to Australia. But for you here today, the part of our biosecurity system that you are already involved in, whether you realise it or not, is post-border. While on this slide, it is emphasising our ability to respond to an incursion, contain it and then move to declaring freedom from it, we know from experience that many environmental pests, weeds and diseases are very challenging to contain and eradicate. This is where everyone who is already involved in environmental and landscape management can help. So environmental biosecurity, which is what I work on, um, it's the management of risks to the natural environment and to social amenity of pests and diseases entering, emerging, establishing or spreading in Australia. Now, just last week, the National Environmental Biosecurity Framework was finalised. I'm really proud of this piece of work. This framework, which is shown in part here, sets out the vision, goals, objectives and actions that all Australian governments and a number of environmental organisations have agreed are important to deliver on. There are a number of principles that inform the framework, including that we will work smarter together as government, industry and the community in partnership, seeking opportunities to collaborate, identify and share resources and take action. But why does biosecurity matter? What are we investing so much effort and money in to protect? Well, our farms and ecosystems grow the food that feed us and the fibre that clothes us. Our natural resources provide wood for building, clean water to drink and medicine to heal us. Our unique native plants, animals and landscapes support our rich biodiversity that keeps country healthy and that are the pillar of our tourism industry. And our natural and built environments are inextricably linked to our way of life. If exotic pests, 
or diseases entered and spread in Australia. It could cost our agriculture industry upwards of $100 billion and 1.6 million jobs, and environmental assets worth $5.7 trillion, let alone the emotional impact the loss of our way of life would have on our collective identity and values, and on First Nations people's culture, heritage, and connection to country. Imagine an Australia with no wattle trees or waratahs, no magpies or kookaburras, no kangaroos or possums. That's not a country that I want to be a part of at the moment. So what is it that my team does to protect all of this? Many of you are probably familiar with the work on invasive pest animals and weeds that are already in Australia. However, we also have a lot to prevent and respond to do. We have a lot to do with preventing and responding to new exotic risks. And this is because, and I'm sure you have all seen this invasion curve slide many, many, many times before, but of course, preventing the establishment of pest animals and weeds and protecting Australia from pest and disease incursions provides the greatest return on investment compared to asset-based protection, which only takes place once pest animals or weeds are established. So we assess the threat that exotic species might pose if it was to arrive. In fact, we do this under both the Biosecurity Act and the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Late last year, the National Priority List of Exotic Environmental Pests, Weeds and Diseases was released. This list sets out the 168 exotic species that we are most concerned about if they were to arrive in Australia, noting that it's not an exclusive list. So there are many other things we are worried about, but we might not have enough information on them to actually do a proper assessment. So we look at the pathways that risks might come in on. Shipping containers, vessels, mail, cargo, passengers, and of course the wind and tides. We look at whether we have the right hosts and conditions for them to establish and spread and what the consequence of that might be. Unfortunately, we find environmental biosecurity risks at our border almost daily and our system is not impenetrable, either because biosecurity risk species are so small and cryptic that we can't easily see them, they are intentionally smuggled in, or because we simply can't inspect every single container and consignment that comes into the country. So that's why in 2012, the National Environmental Biosecurity Response Agreement, or NEBRA, came into play to support the ability of all Australian governments to respond to biosecurity risks that might get past our borders. And of course, when we can't eradicate something, we either try to contain it or have to manage it to protect environmental and other assets. As I'm sure you are all very well aware, established pest animals and weeds are a significant economic, environmental and social burden for Australia. Management of these are a shared responsibility between landholders, community, industry and government, noting it is primarily the responsibility of state and territory governments and landholders. However, notwithstanding this shared responsibility, the Australian government does invest strategically where it is in the national interest to do so. Since 2015-16, we've invested or committed $212 million in established pest and weed management programs. There is additional funding also invested through the Regional Land Partnership, National Land Care Program, under the Threatened Species Recovery Strategies, and of course, the Bushfire Recovery Programs. The EPBC Act provides for the identification and listing of threatening, key threatening processes and for the creation of a threat abatement plan or TAP, where it would be feasible, effective and efficient to abate the process in order to protect our most threatened species. So there are currently 21 key threatening processes and 12 TAPs. A team in my office developed TAPs with assistance from other governments, natural resource managers and scientific experts and facilitates their implementation. TAPs currently cover a range of feral and predatory invasive animals, plant diseases and invasive weeds. And we're about to embark on a flurry of TAP reviews and rewrites. So keep an eye out if you would like to be involved in that. There's also a range of national action plans, frameworks, strategies and coordinator roles, amongst other things. And they've been developed um, and that they include the Australian Weed Strategy, Australian Pest Animal Strategy, draft national feral pig and deer action plans and ant plans. These plans and strategies help guide and prioritise investment and activity, given the huge scale and complexity of the issues involved. 
So it's this scale and complexity, particularly in the environmental space, uh, and why it is so important that biosecurity is a partnership. So while governments at all levels are involved, there is a really important role for the community and the individuals. The general public, as well as farmers, other landholders and managers, indigenous ranger groups and organisations like land care and natural resource management groups have a key role to play. You know the landscape you work within. You know it's important. You also know when its health is affected or when something isn't quite right. In particular, we are working to improve how we connect and partner with land managers and community groups to support them better, to be better prepared for, respond to and manage biosecurity risks. I'm particularly keen to hear your perspectives on this, so please pop them in the Q&A for the um, session after my talk. So what are some of the environmental biosecurity issues we are most concerned about at the moment? Well, myrtle rust, a fungal plant disease, arrived in Australia back in 2010 and quickly became established. The disease attacks more than 2,000 species in the Myrtaceae plant family, which in Australia includes eucalyptus, paper bark, tea trees and lily pillies. Myrtle rust is native to South and Central America, but has spread to North America, Asia, South Africa, New Caledonia, and most recently New Zealand, potentially blown there on the wind from the incursion in Australia. We believe this is also how Myrtle Rust got to Norfolk Island and Lord Howe Island. Now, crucially, the biodiversity of native animals and plants that depend on Myrtaceae species and the habitat that those species provide for food and for shelter are negatively affected and habitat loss can be considerable. While one strain of myrtle rust is here, our aim is to now prevent its spread and stop other exotic strains and destructive pests, weeds and diseases that may affect the resilience of Myrtaceae from arriving. Now, in good news, we know from the experience of Lord Howe Island that was shared at the National Myrtle Rust Symposium held earlier this year, that when an incursion is detected early enough, it is possible, though difficult, to actually eradicate it. I definitely commend the crew on Lord Howe Island for their efforts. Now, I definitely recommend that anyone interested in Myrtle Rust go check out the resources and presentations from the Symposium on the Australian Plant Biosecurity Clients Foundation website. A range of Nautilus products will also be made available soon. And of course, there's a number of other actions that are underway um, to develop a greater understanding and knowledge base of just what is at risk from Myrtle Rust in this country. City Mode, also called rock snot, absolutely delightful, is a freshwater algae that is widespread in the Northern Hemisphere and since 2008 has been found in parts of the New Zealand South Island. It is highly invasive and is one of the higher risk species on our exotic environmental pest list, that priority list I mentioned before. Um, and we want to keep this out of Australia as it is known to have considerable adverse effects on freshwater ecosystems as well as human and economic effects. So we know from New Zealand's experience that just between 2011 and 2020, the economic impacts of Didymo could be as high as $854 million. Didymo reduces recreational values and tourism values. It causes the loss of native species. It increases costs for drinking water and impacts on cultural values, including customary fishing and on human health from eye irritation in swimmers and injuries from slipping on rocks. But given it's not yet in Australia, what are we doing to prepare in case it does arrive? So Australian governments moved quickly to re reduce the risk to Australia when it was found in New Zealand. We included additional screening on incoming passengers who may have been in freshwater environments and developed a national preparedness plan that sets out the measures within and between jurisdictions that will be undertaken should Didymo be suspected or detected. And this plan has recently been updated and an exercise to test the plan is also being progressed. Now, concern around Didymo has actually led to a heightened awareness of the spread of aquatic pests and weeds more broadly. So that's actually been one of the inadvertent benefits. Established pest animals, which does include insects, alter landscapes, they compete with native animals for food and habitat and are responsible for killing vulnerable marsupials, reptiles and birds. For marine feral species, we have no idea how large or widespread their populations may be. 
in part because they're often nocturnal and because they've moved into remote areas that are difficult to survey. However, my office is working closely with the Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics to map the distribution of a range of invasive species and improve the data we have on them nationally. Now, one of my key roles is also to coordinate stakeholders, including in my own department, to drive greater cooperation and collaboration between those focused on the primary production impacts of established pest animals and those focused on environmental impacts, especially where there are joint benefits. So the draft feral pig and deer action plans are just two examples of taking a cooperative approach that should deliver broad production and environmental benefits once they are finalised and implemented. And obviously there's a huge amount of effort also you know, going on elsewhere around um, established pest animals and I just cannot go into detail um, with the time I've got today, so please forgive me. Now weeds, uh, they have a major economic, environmental and social impact. They cause damage to natural landscapes, agricultural land, waters, ways, and coastal areas. So in 2012, a threat abatement plan or TAP was finalized for the key threatening process relating to five invasive grasses present in Northern Australia. And one of the grasses covered, gamba grass, is responsible not only for biodiversity losses, but also for altering fire regimes in Northern Australia. Now, unfortunately, a significant proportion of Litchfield National Park has already been infested and Kakadu National Park is at risk. Other initiatives have included uh, the Weeds of National Significance, which started in 1999 and ceased formally in 2013. 32 species were identified as WANs during this time. And the initiative raised awareness, understanding and reduced the impact of widespread weeds. It encouraged national partnerships to leverage support and resources. And importantly, even when it ceased, it was clear that a legacy had been then created where initial investment in coordinated collaborative efforts resulted in a lasting capacity and information capital. So in order to capitalize on this legacy of wands, but create a framework for today, the national established weeds priorities framework uh, is being developed and it will build on the success and lessons learned from the WANS initiative. The framework will be co-designed, it's a national program, and it will take into account regional priorities and systems and integrate with broader land management issues and action. Stakeholder consultations for this work are now underway and views are being sought through a series of workshops with further opportunities for input to be made available in the future. So I definitely encourage you to keep an eye out for that. And if you would like to know more, please email the um, account on the screen at the moment, pestanimalsandweeds at agriculture.gov.au. <sighs> invasive ants. Since January 2017, invasive ants have been the pest requiring national responses under the National Environmental Biosecurity Response Agreement, or NEVRA, which I mentioned earlier. So invasive ants are among the most serious global invasive pests. They are a diverse group of ant species originating from many regions and can be introduced through a variety of pathways, either as hitchhikers on conveyances, including shipping containers and agricultural machinery, or with specific goods, such as soil, hay, or plant material. And they generally have a reliance on human mediated dispersal and are often found in or near populated areas. They have the potential to negatively impact the Australian environment, our agriculture industries, infrastructure, human health and our social amenities. While the impacts of invasive ants on biodiversity in Australia have not been fully quantified, they are variously known to predate upon and compete with native animals and native ants, and they can modify habitat structures and alter ecosystem processes. As you can see from the map of the southeast Queensland biosecurity zones for reefer, uh, red imported fire ants, um, super colonies and nests can be found over many, many hectares. And these ant species, because of the human mediated dispersal, can end up in huge areas um, of, of our community. So hey, they can, yep. Just one, just wanting to let you know that last minute before we move on to Q&A, please. Thanks, Alice. Fantastic, I'm nearly done. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll just note we have ant plan, it sets out specific actions and priorities. Um, and while a number of invasive ants now call Australia or parts of its home, 
that hasn't stopped our efforts to eradicate them. Now, this is my key message. Uh, we need your help to build on the efforts so far and keep the momentum going. Um, doing anything about biosecurity is all about the people. You're our greatest asset for action. So we're looking more and more to community groups like Landcare to keep doing what you are doing, but with new intent and greater understanding around biosecurity. And we need your support um, with reporting through citizen science apps um, and knowledge sharing through networks like communities of practice. We also know that traditional owners want a say in the prevention and management of invasive species. And it's absolutely imperative to ensure that healthy environments equals healthy land, which equals healthy people. So hopefully this gives you a better idea of why biosecurity matters to land care, but more importantly, why land care matters to biosecurity. So I do hope you have questions for me as I finish up, um, but I'd actually like to leave you all with the question of what are the three things that you can do to help strengthen our biosecurity outcomes. It might be downloading that reporting app you've heard about or reminding family and friends to double check where that online seller of seeds is actually based. Hint, it is probably not Australia, or checking out the new biosecurity portal and letting us know what resources we can add to the knowledge base. And of course, if you do see something that you think is a biosecurity risk, secure it and report it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Alice. was very informative. So quickly, just one comment, which got lots of votes, feedback to presenters. Nothing under 14 point text is visible. Uh, so that's just maybe for future. Anyway, that's not a question. The second question is from Oscar. What is the position of your department on feral horses, especially in the snowy mountains, where they are having a large impact on many threatened species? They, they, they absolutely are. Um, feral horses are not within the remit of um, my office. Um, we are very aware and we are working with our um, natural heritage colleagues and our national parks colleagues um, on uh, different approaches and different opportunities that we can take to actually strengthen how feral horses can be managed in uh, Kosciuszko National Park and the Alpine region. Now, feral horse management is a matter for state government. So in this case, it's the ACT, New South Wales and Victorian governments but we are very engaged with them on improving um, how feral horses can be managed. And deer as well, deer and pigs are a big concern up in the Alpine region too. Fantastic. Now the second question from Rosalind, how will groups like us be involved in implementing biosecurity actions following the new strategy, particularly in the cane toad space? <laughs> well, Cane toads already have a threat abatement plan, so I would definitely recommend um, checking out the threat abatement plan and seeing what it is that your organisation can do around the priority actions identified in, in that. Um, obviously, there's a lot of academics that are doing research on cane toads, so you can hook in and see what you can do to help support their research um, or provide data back. Um, we know that cane toads and the risk of cane toads coming south is increasing, um, so everyone does have to be aware, but there's been a huge amount of advancement in how cane toads uh, can be managed. Um, and so it's it's definitely a space that is has a lot of activity already going on. So yeah, just keep an eye out and, and find the places where you can best engage. Fantastic. Our next question is from Karen. Is climate change making these problems worse? It, it really can, and in two different ways. So climate change can not only alter the types of species and the suitability of the climate, the climatic suitability of species coming to our country. Um, it can also alter the resilience of our native species to being able to ward off um, exotic pests and diseases and, and counter them. Um, so we're, we're concerned about climate change impacts from those two different angles and, and we are very aware of it and we are concerned about it, yes. Fantastic. And uh, our last question is from Van. Are feral rabbits considered an issue? Uh, very much considered an issue. Um, so my office um, works, uh, there's uh, I think a, a feral, um, sorry, a European rabbit threat abatement plan. Um, my office also has a lot of involvement on the 
uh, biological control activities around um, rabbits. Uh, so the um, Khaleesi virus release, a lot of the research and the effort and the, the recent strain that was released a few years ago, very, very heavily involved in that. But it is a national effort. It's not just about the Commonwealth, but we do help provide coordination. We do help lead on those really important and significant national concerns. Okay, fantastic. Now, the right on time. So thanks very much, Elise, and uh, for this informative and very important session and your content uh, about biosecurity. And also thank, thank you to all participants for submitting your questions and to you, Elise, for answering them. It's been fantastic. So, and uh, yeah, I would like to thank you all. And the next session starts in five minutes on this environmental and climate change streams. So yeah, so just, just like to let you know. Okay. Thank you very much for no having worries. me.